So we, again, are getting ready to participate in a very short war that will sometimes be referred to as, in quotation marks, not mine, the splendid little war. Um, and again, kind of an odd way to refer to uh, a war, but it again is part of this continuing imperialization of uh, our part of the hemisphere. So we've got a lot of definitions that we need to know. Jose Martin is the Cuban patriot. So he's the guy in Cuba that's saying Cubans want their independence from Spain. Cuba is a territory of Spain. And so this is the weird part that the United States is in this time period. We, as a country, are imperializing other places like Hawaii, like we just did. But we're also advocating for countries like Cuba to overthrow their imperialist. So it's kind of a weird place that we're at. We're doing two things. We are imperializing, like we just did Hawaii, and then we're also encouraging Cuba to overthrow their imperialist. And guess what we're going to do when they overthrow their imperialist? We're going to take Cuba. So it's a very strange place to be. William Randolph Hearst is the owner of the New York Journalist, who, along with Joseph Pulitzer, starts this idea of yellow press, of the yellow journalism. These two men are in New York City, and their goal is to sell a whole bunch of newspapers. So the word news for them is a really kind of a fluid word because they make up stuff. Uh, they sensationalize things all in an effort to sell newspapers. So they are not, it's kind of ironic that Joseph Pulitzer is the Pulitzer Prize, which is awarded for excellence in journalism, is given by a guy who could care less about journalism. He just wanted to sell newspapers. And one of the things they're going to do is exaggerate what the Spanish had been doing to the Cuban people. We have this word jingoism, it's aggressive nationalism. And George Dewey will be the Commodore that's gonna destroy the Spanish fleet in Manila, and that's in the Philippines. Um, we have Emilio Agu Aguilano, who is a leader of the Filipino nationalists. Anybody know that we had a war with the Philippines? There's another one. And then the Rough Riders. This is probably if you ask anybody about the Spanish-American War and they say, I don't know anything about that, then you mention it's the one where Teddy Roosevelt is a Rough Rider and he leads a charge up San Juan Hill. They're like, oh, yeah, I know that. That's that war. Most people think that's World War I just because that's where they kind of move all that uh, stuff around in their head. It's a volunteer cavalry. Cavalry is a horse uh, unit uh, assembled by Theodore Roosevelt. And it's really hard to have a cavalry unit on an island that's a jungle, right? That, that It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. They're also going to go down to Cuba to fight in August and September in wool uniforms. Another thing that's not going to make sense. Um, and... The war is going to end with the Treaty of Paris. The Spanish-American War uh, ends, and as a result, the United States gets Puerto Rico, which we still have as a territory, and then we're going to buy the Philippines. Um, and eventually we give the, that back in the late 70s, early 80s. So in 1897, Spain was in decline as an imperialist power. Spain only has left that they control as a territory, Puerto Rico, Cuba and the Philippines. If any of you have ever known anyone who is Filipino or from the Philippines, um, it is the reason that a lot of their last names are uh, very Hispanic sounding. Like one of my uh, best friends in high school was Filipino and her last name was Vasquez, which is not something that you think from a last name from uh, a Asian island in the Pacific. Uh, Spain had had the Philippines for a very long period of time. So that's all they had left. And as a result, most of those are in Puerto Rico and Cuba in the hemisphere that the United States says, this is our place. We don't want uh, imperialists in our country any longer. 
1895, Cuban patriot, Jose Martin, launches a war for independence. It's the first reason that we support the Cubans, right? Because we had done the same thing in 1775. We want our independence, throw out our, um, our uh, imperialist oppressors. And as a result, there begins a war, very much like our revolutionary war, between Cubans, nationalists, and Spain. The difference being that the Cubans really don't have a chance militarily of defeating Spain. And this Spanish general is very brutal in his attempts. Tens of thousands of farmers are going to die in concentration camps. So that's the first thing he does is instead of letting, instead of his, I'm sorry, his uh, approach is I'm not going to have these people fight against me. I'm just going to round everybody up and put them in a concentration camp. And so that's what he does. And in this concentration camp, they're going to starve to death and they're going to die of disease. So these tens of thousands of people die. They are not um, um, uh, military or soldiers. They're just regular people. And in that, there will be women and children. That is what the yellow press, that is what Hearst and Pulitzer uh, put in their newspapers. And again, they sensationalize these emotional headlines about what the Spanish have done to these farmers. They did that, but it really was, again, uh, very much pulled out of context in those newspapers. So the United States is being fed, uh, the, I'm sorry, the people are being fed these emotional headlines and they begin to press the government, we got to do something. We need to do something to help the Cubans. And so, in response, McKinley says, Spain, you need to make peace. And we're going to send a very visible reminder of the power of the United States. And we're going to send the battleship, the USS Maine, to Havana to protect American citizens, because this is getting a little crazy. It is a very aggressive move to park a warship in another country's harbor. It's just not something you do. We would not pull up to a harbor off of China and park our aircraft carrier. Well, first of all, we wouldn't even get that close, but that's called provocation. Uh, and it is a hostility step that the United States has taken. William Hearst published a letter stolen from the Spanish ambassador that insulted President McKinley. And he puts that letter in the newspaper. And again, how dare they? Who do they think they are? And we also have to add in this that there has not been a war in Europe since 1815, except Crimea War over in, off the uh, Balkan Peninsula. But Europe has been basically peace for almost a hundred years. People forget the intensity of war. And what is happening with European nations is they are all beating their chest that we are the best, and this in heightened, inflamed time period sends any little slight, just insulting President McKinley, to another level. And so what happens on February 15th, the Maine is going to explode and it's going to kill 266 American sailors on board the ship. And this instantaneously becomes front page newspaper everywhere because the belief is that the Spanish bombed the ship. What we now know as a result of an investigation in 1976 is it's what happened often on these new ships with boilers and heat sources that the boiler room just blew up. The boiler room blew up and killed. But the United States, and more importantly, newspapers use this event as a way to begin the Spanish-American war. The yellow press demands war. Headline scream, remember the Maine. 
and the rest of it is to HE Double Toothpicks Spain. A Naval Board of Inquiry blamed the mine for an explosion, which they possibly could not have done a good inquiry because they were not allowed access. Spain says, holy cow, whoa, wait a minute. This is going too fast. We do not want war. Tell us what you want. We will agree to everything you say. So the Spain is saying, wow, that was really bad. We don't think we did that. But whatever you think we did and whatever you want us to do, write it down on a piece of paper and we will check mark and do every single thing. They, in concentration camps, they remove the general that was in charge of the concentration camp. They do everything. But again, this inflated sense of imperialism, nationalism, McKinley says, nope, don't care. We're going to war. And he asked, as presidents have to do, Congress, do I have permission to your permission to go to war? So McKinley seeks permission from the United States Congress. And in April, following a very heated debate, because really, what are we fighting for here? Right? Bless you, whoever that was. Congress agrees to McKinley's request. So in other words, the... McKinley's uh, request for war goes to Congress and it is voted and uh, the eyes have it. Critics say all we really wanted was to take Cuba. That would be correct. But in order for those people to be sidelined, like, nope, you guys are really wrong, we create the teller agreement or the Teller Amendment, which is added, that says the United States is not going to annex Cuba. That is not why we're going to war. Now, all the critics say, yep, that's why we're going to war. So the other people say, we'll just write this amendment and say, we're not really going to war at all for to get Cuba. And so the Teller Amendment is there. The Cubans are like, awesome. You're going to throw out Spain. We're going to get our own country. Thank you very much, United States of America. The United States, oh, I'm sorry, that last one was there. Is there more on that one? Oh, gosh, okay. United States Navy sends a blockade to Cuban ports. So a blockade is a line of ships that are going to go out into the Atlantic that will not allow Spanish ships to come in. So that is one line of defense that will keep Spain from uh bringing any new supplies, bringing any new men into Cuba. And a blockade is a really good, especially now that the, the United States actually has a Navy. Uh, and what happens is each ship is giving, given a plot in the ocean. And they just navigate in zigzag or in triangle format their little station. They get a plot of the ocean. This is from this latitude to this latitude, this longitude to this longitude, that's your patrol. And they just patrol. And if ships come close, they start sounding off things. They wave up flags and say, hey, you're getting close. If you get much closer, we'll fire on you. And it worked. McKinley calls for 100,000 volunteers. And 100,000 men are going to immediately volunteer. Who are these men that are going to volunteer? For the most part, they were children during the Civil War. Remember that reading we did about Teddy Roosevelt where he's watching all these men come home and bands are playing. So all of these men that missed or these young men or boys that watched all the accolades and the war heroes. And when men come home, they kind of tell these war stories. This is now their war. So there's a hundred thousand men that are going to volunteer to go fight down in Cuba to get rid of Spain. So, in response, Spain now declares war on the United States, and the war begins with victories in the Philippines, not even anywhere near Cuba. Commodore George Dewey, we do not have a rank of Commodore in the Navy anymore, but this is one of the highest ranks at the time that you could have had, surprised and easily defeated the Spanish fleet at Manila Bay. So we win that, defeat the Spanish, 
the Filipinos also say, great, thanks for getting rid of these Spanish oppressors. We are now going to be a free country. But rather than to surrender, the United States force, or rather than to surrender to the Filipino independence fighters, Spain surrenders to the United States. Okay, we're going to surrender. We give up. So that's happening all the way across the Pacific Ocean in the Philippines. So that little part happens first. The United States easily defeats Spain in Cuba. Guantanamo Bay is captured. For those of you that know anything about present day Cuba, it is the one place that we still have in Cuba is Guantanamo Bay. It was part of the deal when the United States actually finally in the 1950s gave Cuba back to themselves. We leased that base for 99 years. Theodore's Rough Riders and two segments of African-American soldiers storm San Juan Hill. Spanish fleet destroyed at Santiago, and Spain surrenders. We give up. We give up in Cuba, and we give up in Puerto Rico. So we say done. Spain says we're done. Hooray. We are actually going to have in both Cuba and Puerto Rico more men die of disease than will be killed in the war. I think it's less than 300 men are killed in this war, but we lose about almost four to 5,000 because of diseases like malaria and yellow fever, again, because we're fighting in the summer months. So very quickly, it's over. We're done. And in the Treaty of Paris, oops, sorry. In the Treaty of Paris, Spain gives up Cuba, Puerto Rico, and Guam. Guam is in the Pacific Ocean. And just for your reference, we still have Puerto Rico as a territory and we still have Guam as a territory. And just so that you know what that means, uh, both of those people that live in Puerto Rico and Guam are citizens of the United States. They have all rights as citizens. They have all movement of citizens. They have representation, um, but they can't vote for president. Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico on several different occasions uh, the Puerto Ricans have had votes in their country if they want to become a state. They always vote no. Um, uh, Guam is, has a heavy uh, military presence. I think every military branch is recognized on the island of Guam. Navy, um, Air Force, Marines, and Army. Army is the only one I'm not sure is on Guam. It is an island full of black snakes. There are hundreds and thousands of black snakes that like hang out from the trees. Like the crates. What? Crates or whatever. I'm sorry? Are they called like crates? I don't know. I don't know. Spain sells Philippines for 20 million. Guam and Puerto Rico become American territories. And under the Tele Agreement, Cuba cannot be annexed. So we have that amendment that says that can't happen. So somehow we got to figure out a way around this. Secretary of State John Hay called it a splendid little war. But what and why did we buy the Philippines? Critics like William Jennings Bryan and Mark Twain attacked imperialism as against American principles. And they will be known as anti-imperialist. Did you guys just finish Mark Twain? So that's another reason, again, to add Mark Twain to why he's important is this anti-imperialism. <clears throat> President McKinley is going to argue that the United States had a responsibility to uplift and civilize the Filipino people, whether they wanted to or not. McKinley will call them um, his little, in quotation marks, brown brothers. However, the Filipinos said, not so fast. We don't want to be imperialized, and we are going to fight you. And they do. The Filipinos 
wage a rebellion against the United States. More Americans are going to die in the Philippines during this insurrection that we call an insurrection in Filipino history. It's called a revolution. Um, and uh, more people, more American soldiers are going to die in this uh, Filipino rebellion, or again, as they call it, a revolution. In February 1899, the Senate ratified the Peace of Tr Treaty of Paris by one vote. One vote. In the election of 1900, McKinley faced Bryan for presidency, and McKinley takes Theodore Roosevelt, the hero of San Juan Hill, as his running mate, and McKinley and Roosevelt easily win that election. The United States has a new empire, and more importantly, a new stature in world affairs. So now we have become both an economic superpower a military superpower, and we're on our way to becoming a political superpower. And our last, I don't know if I have you write anything on this one, do I? Uh, what were the causes and effects of the Spanish-American War? Economic interest, growth of national imperialism, aggressive yellow press, and the United States acquire colonies and become a world power as a result of the Spanish-American War. I hope it is not lost on you that we begin our history as a colony, we free ourselves from that and become our own country, and then we begin colonizing other places. Um, I hope that is not lost on you, how that circle has come back around, okay? All right, so that finishes that um, second section. The graphic organizer that you have in Canvas, again, it's a chart. And uh, Tipton had asked, do, we, do they have to be in complete sentences? When you answer questions on a chart, it does not have to be in complete sentences, except for the last question. Tipton, do you have that open now? Yeah. What does that last question on page two say? Um, how did the Spanish American War affect the United States history? That you have to have a, a complete paragraph. One paragraph, that's the only one that has to be, because that kind of sums up the whole chart. All right, Emma, did I answer your question, hon? Do, what, honey? do you want me to go back? Okay. I will, but I don't want to do it while I'm recording because it'll make the people watching this like, why did she go back? Why is she doing that? Because I'm fairly certain they don't listen to me, but I'll, I'm just happy that they watch. <laughs>